We now move on to a discussion of bacterial growth. When we talk about growth, you would probably think about an increase in size. However, in the microbial world, we are mostly referring to an increase in number. There are rare instances where growth does mean an increase in size. Did you know that the biggest organism ever measured was a fungus? A member of Armillaria ostoyae in western Oregon forest soil is 10 square kilometers in size and is estimated to be as old as 8,650 years. Check out the included link if you want to know more. Many microbes grow by binary fission and it's the best understood. In this form of asexual reproduction, one bacterium splits into two identical forms. In the next generation, those two become four, then four become eight, and so on. This is a common mode of growth in bacteria, archaea, and microbial eukaryotes. Keep this math in mind. If cells divide by binary fission, then all cells in a population are, quote, clones, unquote, of the original. As time goes on, cell numbers increase exponentially by powers of two. Thus, for bacteria, rapid population growth is possible. It all depends upon the time it takes to go through a division. Because bacterial growth is exponential, it is customary to graph their population using a log scale. Cells that divide by binary fission go through a series of steps. First, there is an increase in cell content and volume. Two cells are going to need twice as many elements, monomers, and proteins, etc. These take up more volume, thus the cell expands. This expansion manifests as the lengthening of the cell and an increase in macromolecules. The bacterium makes more ribosomes and peptidoglycan. The bacterium polymerizes to build more cell wall. Finally, DNA replication makes two copies of the genome. All of this is occurring as the cell expands. Eventually, it's time to divide. The cytoskeleton will separate the two genomes into different regions in the cell. The FTSZ ring forms in the middle and creates the divisosome complex. With hydrolysis of ATP, the FTSZ ring contracts, splitting the cell membrane in two. Peptinoglycan synthesis then occurs between these two membranes. Thus, the site of FTSZ ring contraction guides the formation of the septum. Cells that are deficient in FTSZ fail to septate and will form long filaments. How does the FTSZ protein find the middle of this cell? The mechanism varies between species. Here we talk about the well-studied example of E. coli. The MIN system is composed of three proteins, MIN C, D and E. Min CD form a complex, initially starting at the poles just under the surface of the membrane and building toward the middle. Min E actively dissipates the Min CD complex, starting in the middle and working towards the pole. As the Min CD proteins are depolymerized by Min E, the Min CD proteins move to the opposite pole of the cell and they then polymerase at this pole. When in min E reaches one pole, it then reforms its ring at the edge of the polymerizing min CD at the other end of the cell. What this causes is a min CD minimum at the center of the cell. Min CD is an inhibitor of FTSZ ring formation. Therefore, the only place FTSZ can efficiently form a ring is in the center of the cell. It may seem like a little bit of a crazy inefficient system, but it works. The cell wall determines the shape of the bacterium, and cell wall synthesis determines this, where the cell wall is formed. Cell wall synthesis patterns vary depending upon species. Synthesis can be all over the place as directed by MRAB location. This figure shows that MRAV forms either loops or a spiral, it's not yet certain which, and cell wall synthesis begins at these locations. In other species, synthesis can be from the poles. In still others, it can occur at the division sites. 
gram-positive spherical cells will not contain MREB. Synthesis of cell walls can occur at the division site and continue until the cell has reached full size. Colobacter species have abandoned them, and this is dictated by crescentin, a protein that lines up on just one side of the cell and bends it down. I want to discuss one cell wall growth system in detail. In E. coli, cell wall growth seems to be determined by peptidoglycan architecture. Remember that MREB dictates where these complexes can form, and the PBP1A protein attaches to MREB. In porous areas of peptidoglycan, shown on the right, LPOA and PBP1A can interact, and this is a signal that causes peptidoglycan synthesis. When the peptidoglycan becomes too thick, LPOA and PBP1A cannot interact, and peptidoglycan synthesis in this area is turned off. As the cell grows and stretches, the peptidoglycan expands, causing LPOA and PBP1A to again be able to interact and peptidoglycan to synthesis to begin again. Now for a concept check. In E. coli, the location of where FTSZ forms the dysosome is determined by, the correct answer is min E, min C, and min D. Binary fission is not the only method of cell division. Some microorganisms divide by budding, forming unequal products. Budding can also occur at the end of a stalk. There are also stalk cells that will divide, forming a swarmer cell. An example of this type of lifestyle is the co are colobacter species that live in aquatic environments. A cell with a stalk will grow a child cell, which eventually breaks off from the stalk cell. The new swarmer cell is motile and will swim away for a while and eventually settle to form a new stalk cell. The stalk cell will continue with another round of a division. Streptomyces species have a filamentous mode of growth. After a spore lands on a suitable medium for growth, it will germinate. The vegetative cell expands, forming long tubes, much like fungi. These mycelium will grow out into the medium, and most of the growth is occurring at the tips of the mycelia. After a period of growth, aerial mycelia will begin to form and eventually divide into spores. These will disperse into the environment, completing the cycle. Fungi also can grow by forming long filaments. However, many can also grow as single cells. These are called dimorphic fungi. When two compatible mating strains encounter one another, they can combine to form a dikaryotic state, where each cell has two nuclei. The dikaryotic state is when reproductive fungal structures form. And these are macroorganisms that we know as mushrooms, puffballs, shelf fungi, and others. So, how do we grow microbes in the lab? Scientists grow microorganisms in the laboratory either in liquid culture called broths or solid medium, most often the same broth, broth but with agar, a solidifying agent added. Broth cultures can range from a few milliliters in a test tube to 100, 100 millimeters in a flask to millions of liters in a fermenter during industrial production. Solid medium most often is used in shallow plates of about 7 to 10 centimeters in diameter. If a single cell of a bacterium is put on a suitable solid medium, it will grow, eventually forming a pile of cells called a colony. Colony shape, color, size, and edge pattern is distinctive for each species. When we describe microbial growth, we are again talking about an increase in population. The growth in number can be measured by counting the cells or by measuring a feature that is associated with cell number increase. The rate of microbial growth is another trait that is unique to each individual species. To determine the growth properties of microorganism, it is most often necessary to isolate the microbe in pure culture. A pure culture is a culture that contains only one type of microorganism. The microbe must be able to grow in the medium in the laboratory. 
If these two conditions are met, then you can study a microorganism. I want you to take a moment and think about how we measure growth. Think about as many examples as you can about how you could do it. Then pick one method and think about the pros and cons of your method. What you're going to do now is walk through all the various methods of measuring growth. First, you can do it directly by counting bacteria in a microscope using a slide with exact squares in it. You count the cells and you know the volume of the squares so you can calculate the cells per mil. Direct counting is fast but can be tedious. One way to speed this up is by using a Coulter counter. A Coulter counter will actually count count each particle as it passes through a capillary. And these particles, which are most often cells, can then be used to calculate a count. Cell counts can also be indirectly determined by diluting cells and plating them over a measuring light scattering, which is turbidity. In plating, you dilute a sample until the concentration of cells is low enough to spread out on a plate. You let the medium grow up and count how many colonies form. The count is reported as CFUs per mil, since we don't know how many cells grew up to form a colony. Plate counts take a long time to do, and you have to wait for incubation. There are many places where errors can occur, so the scientists must be careful while performing plate counts. However, your count is of only viable cells, which is what you want, after all. Turbidity relies on the fact that particles, including cells, scatter light. To measure turbidity, a filtered light passes through the sample. The optical density is a ratio of the log of the incident light versus the unscattered light. The more light scattering, the higher the measured turbidity and the higher the concentrations of cells. The optical density also increases as the concentration of cells increases. OD is normally measured around 600 nanometers because that is the low point for absorption by cellular components. This method is simple, rapid, and accurate. However, it cannot differentiate between living and dead cells. Also, if the turbidity gets too high, it no longer correlates with cell number. Batch cultures are typically grown in the laboratory, which is a closed system like a flask or test tube. When a culture starts, there's often a period of adaptation where the cell expresses necessary pathways and enzymes to use the medium. Once all the enzymes are in place, the microorganism enters the log phase, where it periodically doubles in concentration. The term exponential phase also describes this period. When a nutrient becomes limiting or too many waste products accumulate, the culture will enter stationary phase where the cell population does not change significantly. Eventually, cells begin to starve and break down, at which time the cell culture enters the death phase. Cell numbers begin to drop exponentially. The death phase decline is often slower than the log phase incline. When one cell becomes two, it is a generation. The time this takes is a generation time or doubling time. The growth rate is the number of doublings per unit time and is the reciprocal of the generation time. All these measurements are only valid during log phase. The generation time is a distinctive trait of each species and can vary tremendously. For example, Vibrio cholera has a generation time of 10 minutes, while Mycobacterium species take 24 hours to go through one generation. Other factors can also influence growth rates. If there is a limiting nutrient, it will slow the growth rate. Also, if a microorganism is outside its optimal environmental conditions, for example, the wrong temperature or pH, generation times will be longer. Being able to calculate growth rates and generation times accurately is important for microbiologists. The growth rate formula to calculate generation times is shown on this slide. If you are interested in derivation, consult the textbook. To calculate the growth rate, you need to know the population at two different time points, N2, which is the number of cells, at time point two, N1, which is the number of cells at time point one, 
and T2 and T1 are the times at those two time points. Remember that this formula is only valid during exponential growth, or you know, also called log phase. You then plug these numbers into the formula to determine k, the growth rate. The generation time is simply the reciprocal of k. In this example, taken from actual data that students generated in the microbiology laboratory, we choose N2 to be 10 to the 10th at 5.75 hours and N1 to be 10 to the 8th at 2.75 hours. Plugging those numbers into the equation gives a value of 2.21 generations per hour. The generation time is then the 0.45 hours per generation or 27 minutes per generation. Let's have some practice at this. I think it's really important you figure out how to do this. So I'm going to give you two practice problems here. I'm also going to have you give you a worksheet you can work on at, available at Canvas. Lactococcus lactis is a gram-positive lactic acid bacterium. It does not use oxygen in its metabolism, but does oxygen affect its growth rate? We will grow it in the presence and absence of oxygen and then determine where it grows the fastest. Which condition do you think will allow the fastest growth rate? Please make a prediction. Using the table at right for the growth rate of L. lactis, determine which condition it grows in the fastest. I have provided the example calculations for both. You'll see that it turns out to be 0.85 generations per hour for plus oxygen and 0.84 generations per hour without oxygen. That works out to 1.18 hours per generation or 1.19 hours per generation. In other words, L. lactis grows at the same rate with and without oxygen. This is an important point and a common misconception students have. L. lactis is an aerotolerant anaerobe, and while it can protect itself from oxygen, it does not use it in its metabolism. Therefore, the presence of oxygen makes no difference. Note, make sure that you do your calculation in log phase. The log phase regions in this graph have been highlighted in color. Note how you can observe increases over time in these areas, but not before hour two or after hour 12 or 13, depending on the organism. Let's do another one. You want to cult a culture to reach one times 10 to the ninth at 9 a.m. and you want to start at 5 p.m. You want to inoculate at 5 p.m. the previous day. Assume a two hour lag period and a growth rate of 0 0.5 generations per hour. How many cells should you inoculate into the medium? This helpful rearrangement of the growth equation might help you get that answer. Here is the answer. First of all, you want to start it at 5 p.m. and you want the culture to be ready at 9 a.m. That is 16 hours. Now there's a two hour lag period, T2 minus T1 is 14 hours. You send, then it's simply plug and play. You plug the numbers into the equation and you get an answer of 7.8 times 10 to the 6, or about 8 million cells. Okay, that is the end of the growth part of these lectures.